It is always fun for me to have the chance to meet somebody who appreciates family heritage and family legacy and has a great story to tell. And that is definitely the case with our featured guest today as Susan Combs joins us here on The Big Impact. And she brings with her the story of dad, Major General Roger Combs. And um, Susan, at the very outset, greetings. It's good to see you on Zoom and have you on the program. I understand you're in the, the New York area. So we won't uh, hold that against you as Yankee, <laughs> Yankee haters, that kind of a thing. Um, and, and your book that we're going to talk about called Pancakes for Roger has been out for a few months. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, before we get into the story, what has it been like to know that other people are now discovering what you already knew about your dad, that he was special? Uh, wow. You know, I mean... <sighs> It, my dad was a great guy. He really, really was. And, you know, I even say in the beginning of the book, like I realized that not everybody had a great family or a great father like I did. And so I try to be, um, you know, sensitive to that. Uh, so where I've seen a lot of people um, that have reached out to me that they've said, hey, you know what? I didn't have a great dad. So it was really nice to read about a great dad and just kind of get some of his wisdom because they weren't lucky enough to have the wisdom from a father like I did. Does that mean that as a young girl growing up, Susan never rolled her eyes at her dad? I learned how to roll my eyes when my eyes were closed. Um, <laughs> um, it's so funny you said, because, man, I was, I was, you know, I had a smart mouth and I was pretty quick witted, but um, I had a general as a father who was also a civilian judge. So to say I had a strict upbringing would be a little bit of an understatement. We had a demerit system and a white glove test and in our rooms and everything. Whoa, whoa, wait, wait a second. I need to learn more about this. Now take me inside <laughs> the home of a military run family. You had, you had the white glove test. Yeah. Yeah. Like he was, um, so, so my, my parents actually always tell a story. Um, so my, my parents got married, you know, young. My dad was in the Marine Corps when they, when they got married and, um, my dad was gone, I think for, for active duty for a, you know, a trip or something like that. And my mom as a young, you know, young woman that was married, she was trying to clean the house and being so excited about cleaning the house. And, you know, he came home from his tour and, and, um, she was just so proud of everything. And he went over to the refrigerator and went to the top of the refrigerator and just swiped his finger. <laughs> I I think I'm lucky that my parents stayed married after that, but, but it's always just kind of been a, a funny thing. So, I mean, our beds were definitely made. Um, I, I even make my bed when I'm at a hotel. Uh, so it's just been something that's definitely been ingrained for me. I mean, I, my dad was all about, you know, order and, um, I, I definitely have that type A personality too. Are you bouncing the quarter off of the bedspread <laughs> bed maker kind of a thing? Yeah, you know, maybe not that extreme, but I was actually ROTC for a couple of years in college. And um, so I, I very much appreciate the, um, the military candor and the standards. And, um, you know, it was, it was Halloween yesterday and I actually wore his last flight suit and I, um, I had everything to regulation. So I was very proud. My hair was at regulation. My, you know, my, even my nail polish color, my makeup, everything was <laughs> was perfect. And cause I knew how to do it. And I remember, and my, I sent a picture to my family on the family text. And my mother says, well, I miss your hair. And I was like, mom, we're going for authentic hair. I was like, I have the general's uniform on, I'm going to do it right. So, um, you know, I, I just, I laugh at that for sure. Well, you know, when you have all of those, um, contributing factors in, in the growing up years, I don't think you just shake free of it. I don't think you just forget about all of it, right. It's part of who you are. Yeah. Well, and I appreciate it. I mean, my dad always said we had, you know, two type A's and two type B's and he and I were definitely the type A's. So I think I, um, I miss it, um, a lot because I don't think I realized that my dad was my partner in our family until he passed. Hmm. Um, and I, I actually realized that the, um, the night of his visitation and we had a, a Missouri funeral and then he, my father was ultimately laid to rest at Arlington. And so we had the full uh, military honors at Arlington too. And so with the Missouri funeral, the night of the visitation, I, man, it was like herding cats in my house. And I, I, I said to my brother, my mother, I said, we're the ones that have to be there. We have to be there on time. People are there to, you know, pay their respects to dad and to see us. I'm like, we got to get out of here. And it was like, I, you know, I kind of looked up, you know, in the sky and just was like, dad, come on, just help me out here. And then, you know, everybody kind of came together and we got out the door, but it's, 
I don't think I, that was the first time I was like, oh my God, now, now I know what my role is going to be in this family. Now I know um, that it's, it's going to be a little bit of an uphill battle um, with some of these creatives in my family for sure. Yeah. The, uh, the type A versus the type B personalities, they, they don't always mesh very well, especially when, when somebody's uh, military background kicks in. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My dad and I used to tell my, um, you know, I, one brother that I grew up with and my, my brother and my mother, my dad and I would always tell them that we need to leave a place like 30 minutes before we really had to, um, go because then we knew we'd be on time. Um, he and I always knew, but, but they didn't. So it kind of worked out. Well, for, for major general Roger Combs, um, his, you know, he's a highly decorated veteran. He goes to Vietnam and man, there are so many, um, untold, remarkable stories, both of courage, but also of injury that, that took place in Vietnam. And of course, I think the one that most people, especially my age, which is in 54, in that kind of generation, the, the thing we would have heard about the most would be Agent Orange and some of the chemical warfare that took place over there. And that was a part of your dad's sickness, right? That's what kind of did him in at the end. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he, he passed away. I mean, his death certificate says agent orange related throat cancer. Um, so my, my dad was diagnosed with agent orange related throat cancer in 2008. And, um, so we had 10 relatively good years and then he relapsed twice the last year of his life. And then that was, you know, kind of the beginning of the end. But when he was, he was treated at the Mayo Clinic, um, you know, I'm, I'm from the Northwest corner of Missouri. So the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota is about an eight hour drive. It's not that big a deal to get to. And, great, great facility. And, um, my dad had a pretty major surgery, um, before he started the chemo and the radiation. And we found out four other helicopter pilots that had been with my father all had throat cancer. So we knew that there was just too much, um, of a coincidence there. I mean, of course, when you're dealing with the, the VA claims process, it's a very arduous, um, task to say the least. And of course they said, well, did you, you smoke or drink, sir? And of course everybody <laughs> smoked and drank in, in the sixties and the seventies. Um, but then when we found out that the four other of his helicopter pilot, um, friends and colleagues had also had the same cancer, we knew it was just too much. And so since my father was a, a two-star major general and he was a civilian judge, he knew how to write things, um, and to help with the claims process. And his claim ultimately took about three years and we thought that was horrible, but then I've since started working with the veterans clinic at the university of Missouri school of law. And if you go onto the VA website, it'll put right on there that average claims take seven years. And so they thought that three years was so impressive, even though we thought it was horrible. Um, so it's, it's one of those things that having clinics like the university of Missouri school of law veterans clinic and Syracuse has a great veterans clinic. Um, and there's a lot of wonderful ones. It really helps the veterans navigate the VA claims and appeals process for their families as well. I, I don't want to go off on a, on a political rant, but taking seven years is criminal. I'm sorry. It's, it's just, I, I, know, don't care, I, agree. I, I don't absolutely. care who the president, it doesn't matter. It's just, that's absolutely. just absolutely criminal. And so along this journey, as dad is getting sick and this stuff starts to really take over, I, I would guess there are some choices to be made within the family. And one of those is how are we going to care for dad? He cared for us all these years. And I'd love to have you walk us through what those conversations were like and what that thought process was like. You know, um, I, I was very fortunate, I mean, to have a family that is open and I know that not all families are open. So especially when it comes to health related matters, um, you know, my, my brother, Matt, um, had cancer. He, when we were kids, he had, uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia and he was the first male bone marrow transplant performed at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis. Oh. So it was definitely not our family's first rodeo. And we, um, we've always just been an open conversation when it came to, to health issues. And so my parents told my brothers and I early on, if there was any doctor's appointment we wanted to go to, any questions we wanted to ask, my dad did a power of attorney so that we could call and ask questions to the doctors. And um, we just really had that open line of communication that I know not all families do. Um, and and we were also encouraged as kids to like ask questions and have those tough conversations because a lot of times when somebody says they regret something in their life, I think it's about a conversation that they, they didn't have the courage to have, or they just didn't know how to have it. And so when my, my dad relapsed twice, um, before he passed away, he had a, another major surgery and we didn't know he was going to be able to speak again after that surgery. And so being the type A kid, um, he and I sat down 
I mean, you should see my beautiful spreadsheets. I have some great spreadsheets, but it was conversations like, who's the plumber? Who's the electrician? The basics. Who, do, who do I sell the Winnebago to? I mean, my father, you know, was also an expert marksman and a, and a gun collector. And I was like, who, who do I sell the guns to? What do I do? You know? And just who do I talk to about the military stuff? Who do I talk to about the VA stuff, the pension? Like who, where do I go? So it was, you know, one of those things that it was so necessary and I'm so grateful that we had those conversations because when it came time, like I, I knew where to go. Like I have just like this, I have all the passwords and that's the thing. I mean, we had that time and we were lucky to have that time. I mean, he went on hospice on um, July 16th and he passed away August 22nd, 2018. And so mentally we had some time to prepare for that. I mean, he and I sat down again um, after he re relapsed a second time and just kind of, I mean, he told me what he wanted on his, his headstone at Arlington. Mm. And so it was a way to honor him and to be able to continue to honor him, know what charities he wanted to contribute to, because if you don't make it known and you don't write it down, then, then how are your, how are your loved ones supposed to navigate with it? And hearing that more and more often as friends of ours have suffered loss and, and some who have been very well prepared, their parents had been very well prepared and they're so grateful. And then the others who were like, I don't even know where to start. I have no, so what a, what a blessing for your dad to have walked you through all of those things while he still could. Well, and one of the, I mean, one of the biggest hurdles is, you know, my father, when he was, before he was a judge and he was a practicing attorney, he, he had set up countless trusts for people. And it was like a little bit of a shoemaker's kids where, you know, we didn't have the trust set up. And so I knew that this man wasn't going to relax and let us trigger hospice until he knew his affairs were in order. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, my God love my dad, but um, there were eight properties and seven bank accounts. There was a lot of stuff to get, get organized. And, um, you know, he decided he wanted to do a trust. And so I was gathering the information and he was so sick at that time. Um, I knew I needed to get the deeds of the property and I didn't know where to go. And he would, he would say, oh, we'll talk about it later. And then he'd fall asleep. And so there was a couple of days before I was going to go to back to New York. And I told my mom, I said, I, I just got to figure this out. And so I called Billy Sue Gillespie. She's one of my dad's dear friends and she has an abstract company. And I said, I don't know what to do, but I need the deeds of the property. What do I do? And she's like, oh, honey, just, just meet me at the courthouse. And so I went to the courthouse and you know, the place that my dad worked for, for a very long time. And that these people knew me ever since I was, like, well, since I was born, to be honest. And um, they had all the deeds of the properties ready for me. And I, I remember I came home and he had, he had woken up and um, he said, where you been? And I said, I went to the, the courthouse and I saw Billy Sue. And I, I was like, you know, he can just be mad at me. I, and, <laughs> and he said, did you, did you get the deeds? And I said, yeah. And he said, all of them. And I said, all of them. And he's like, that's my girl. And so I was able to get all that stuff, get it to the attorney. And, um, you know, I'm also used to working with New York city attorneys, which are a little bit different than, um, small town, you know, town of a thousand attorneys. And I'm used to people responding to me pretty quickly. Cause I, I actually work as an expert witness, um, on medical malpractice cases in my professional career, mostly. And, um, I remember calling the attorney because he hadn't responded to me three times. And I said, okay, I don't know what your case work is caseloads like. I know you have other clients, but I think I need you to understand that my father is dying and he will not trigger hospice until he knows his affairs are in order. So I said, if you don't have the capacity, that is fine. Just tell me and I'll move on. But I said, I need you to understand the urgency of this matter. And so he said, Oh, he said, Oh, he called me back in 30 minutes. He's like, Susan, I'm so sorry. So he gets it all together. I told him, I said, your deadline's July 15th. And, um, so he got it all done and he went up to my parents' house to get them to sign the documents. And the last thing he said, when he was walking out the door, he's like, please tell Susan, I beat her deadline by two days. <laughs> you don't want to get in trouble. You don't want to get in trouble. You didn't want to get in yeah. trouble, but you know, it's those things that, man, I mean, one of the first things I did the, the year after my father passed is my husband and I set up our own trust because I said, you know what? I mean, I don't want to have to worry about that. I mean, yeah. I don't want to have my loved ones have to worry about that and have that sense of urgency because, you know, like it or not, I mean, life can change in the blink of an eye. I can, you know, walk across the street, get hit by a bus tomorrow. And then at least my husband has the keys of the castle and he knows the, the plan of action that we need to go through after that. 
Well, as part of all of that, um, that decision to be, to be actively involved in the care of your dad, um, I, I would have to think not only provided you with some great laughs, but probably some extra tears along the way, because here you are now seeing this giant of a man brought to his, his figurative knees by this awful cancer that's going through his throat. Um, and I also have to think that for him, a guy who was used to being in charge of everything and not being questioned yeah. and, you know, being on time and punctual and yes, sir, no, sir. Well, when it comes time to being cared for, that had to be tough on him as well, which I think led to a special morning yeah. where you discovered he was getting a little feisty and decided to, to try something he hadn't done in a long time which is my clumsy way of introducing us into the <laughs> title of your book. So, you know, my, my dad, my dad was an excellent patient. I will say there are some not so good patients and there are some excellent patients. Um, I've encountered that with my mother and she's the opposite, <laughs> but um, my, my father was a great patient. And the thing is like, I treated my father like a person and I talked to him how I would want somebody to talk to me. And so it was rational. And he was rational. So um, prime example, um, I came back home one time because my mother needed to like take the dog to the vet and go to her own doctor's appointments. And my dad said, oh, I'm fine. I'm fine by myself. And I said to him, I said, you know what? You probably are. But I said, the risk factor associated with being wrong here and falling and having mom never forgive herself because something happened to you isn't worth it. I said, this isn't about you. This is about her. And when I said that to him, he's like, okay. And so then he understood it because then it was rational to him. Um, but with the, the title of Pancake Sir Roger, I mean, that comes from, like you said, an exchange I had with my father. I was very fortunate enough that I, I moved back to King City, Missouri. You know, um, the population now is 1,013. It was 986 when I left. So it's a population booming. explosion. Booming, yes. Um, <laughs> does have the first wind farm in the state of Missouri. And Roger Worley, if you're a football fan, is from my hometown. He's in the Hall of Fame. So that's, that's our claim to fame, too. But <laughs> so my... Um, you know, I was able to, to move back home. He and I very much type a had our schedule. I mean, I'd get up at 5.00 AM. I check on him. If he was good, I'd go to the gym, come back, check on him again. If he was good, I'd shower and then come and help him get ready for the day. And then I would get him into his chair after he'd have his, his uh, tube feeding formula. And then I'd sit at the coffee table with my laptop and work all day. And if you need anything, I was right there. So one morning we went through that same rigmarole that we normally do. But then after I was done showering and I came to get him from his hospital bed, because we were very fortunate to have hospice at home. My dad did, like you said, he believed in taking care of his family. So we had a great long-term care policy that he got when they first came out um, because he wanted to make sure that he had things the way he wanted to. And so I went to his hospital bed and he wasn't there. I went to the living room. He wasn't there. And so I went to the kitchen and he was sitting at the table and he had his place mat out and he had set the table. And I looked at him and I said, dad, what are you doing? And he said, I want pancakes for breakfast. And it just, just broke my heart because if you've ever dealt with somebody on a feeding tube, that's how they get their nutrition. There's no, no way around it. And I looked at him and I said, oh, dad, there's just nothing in this world that I want to give you more than pancakes for breakfast. But I said, we have a feeding tube, you're on hospice, we have a DNR. And I said, if you choke, I said, we're done here. And I just don't think we're <laughs> wow, quite wow. ready to be done. Yeah. And he looked at me and he said, oh yes, I can. <laughs> he said, Matt said I could, and Matt's my brother and he's a nurse and he wasn't there that morning. So I knew we were dealing with some confusion from his oxygen levels getting too low. And so I looked down and I said, well, let me see what I can do. So I took his tube feeding formula over to the microwave. The general always wanted it warmed up for 14 seconds, not 13, not 15, <laughs> 14. Well, and so I heated up for 14 seconds and I came back to the table and I sat the, the pitcher down on the table and he said, what's that? And I said, that's your syrup. So his oxygen levels kind of started rallying around and he kind of understood and he smiled and he said, okay. So a few short weeks later, he passed away. And, um, I took one day off work when I came back to New York, my husband said to me, he said, why don't we go have some pancakes for your dad? So my husband snapped a picture and I told the story on social media. And I said, you know, if you're so inclined, go out and have some pancakes for Roger and remember the, the good things in your life and the little things that you appreciate, because at the end of the day, it's the little things that make such the biggest impact. Um, no play on words for your, <laughs> for right, your right. but, um, and it just 
blew up. <laughs> I mean, so people started having pancakes and then they'd send pictures. And so then we started hashtagging pancakes for Roger. And so what it led to is the month of February, since his birthday is on February 22nd, my company started making a donation in his honor for every picture we got to the University of Missouri School of Law Veterans Clinic. And um, so this past year, the book came out on his birthday on 2-22-22. And we hit all 50 states, 18 countries. I mean, we got thousands of pictures for pancakes, thousands of dollars of donations for the, for the University of Missouri. And it's just been so rewarding. So <laughs> It, it's the pancakes for Roger thing started out as a movement to help the veterans clinic and help, you know, veterans like himself. And then it, you know, I had people that were after me to write a book for a while. And, um, you know, my dad was only supposed to be a chapter in the book, to be honest. Hmm. Uh, so it was going to be highlighting a bunch of different mentors that I had. And then my dad just took over the whole freaking book. Like he, <laughs> you know, like the general did. <laughs> right. And, um, and so I was really able to, to share a lot of the life lessons and some lessons from some other mentors too, but it was very much a cathartic process for me. I think, um, in families, I think there's a kid that always kind of gravitates to a parent. Um, and, and that just kind of handles things. And so I really stepped into my dad's shoes and I handled a lot of the finances and dealt with the VA. I mean, there was one week that, man, I logged 14 hours on the phone with the VA, with Arlington, with you know, the Department of Defense, like just all this crazy stuff just to get things organized. And um, and so I think since I hit the ground running so much on that family, family business time is how I let it listed in my calendar. I, um, I missed part of the grieving part. Um, so writing this book, I think was very much of a healing process. I mean, I ugly cried every single week, um, when I was going through the process, but it's just been so rewarding because so many people have just come out with other stories about my dad that we just never heard of. And it was, it's just been great. So when you, when you do sit down at the keyboard and you start to try to gather and organize and then present a lifetime of memories and lessons and the things that you want people not just to know about your dad, but how what he believed in could also help their lives. Um, is that, that that sounds like a very daunting challenge, especially if you're not a prolific writer, if, if you haven't done 15 other books, this first time experience would have to be pretty overwhelming. Yeah, I mean, so the company I worked with is called Scribe Media. Um, and, you know, they're my my publisher and they're they're fantastic. And so they definitely have a process. So a lot of the whole process is is videos, is recording and you talking and telling stories. And then it's easier to, because it's always easier to tell a story than, than start typing yeah. words on a page. And so when we were kind of going through the process, we saw that there were themes. So the book separated into four sections, self-love, family, and career because that's where the lessons just kind of fell into. And so it was much easier to do it that way. And then the book's also written kind of in vignette style. So there might be a chapter that's a paragraph mm -hmm. um, with a lesson. And I think the longest chapter maybe is 10 pages. I mean, it's pretty easy to pick up and put down. I've had some friends and colleagues that have said that they're using it almost like as a daily motivational type of thing. And they just read like one lesson a day. Um, and it's been kind of, kind of fun that way, but start to finish, if you picked up the book and read it, it'd be about three and a half hours. So it's, it's not a lot of fancy words. It's just a whole lot of heart for sure. Well, I can't, I can't imagine any father anywhere that would not be deeply honored by having their daughter or one of their children do something like that in their memory and to keep, keep their memory alive. But when you look back at Let's, let's say, uh, you know, eight to 15 year old Susan growing up in this house. What's the dad memory that kind of tops the charts? Uh, <laughs> do, do you, do you have a subject matter? <laughs> well, yeah. How about, how about this? How about first time you brought boy home and dad got to meet that boy? You know, so my, I will tell you, okay. So the dating rule in our house is you had to know how to change a tire and you had to have your driver's license. Okay. So, um, because my dad was all about the worst case scenario. And I look at worst case scenario for a living now because I own an insurance brokerage too. And, um, so those were the things my dad wanted you to always have the tools to be able to get out of a situation and always be situationally aware. So, um, so those were, I mean, I, and to be honest, like I didn't have my first boyfriend until I was 18. So, and it wasn't any you know, any like rule in the house or anything like that. I was just too busy with, with sports and school, school activities to really care too much. But, um, I, I would say like one of the, um, 
<laughs> one of the best lessons that I remember getting. Uh, so we had a foreign exchange student that lived with my family when I was 16 and named Anna. And we're, we're tremendously close. I mean, our families are very, very close. We used to uh, spend time together every year. Um, and my parents, you know, would still go there and see them until my dad passed. And, um, one day, I mean, I got ticked off at Anna for something, just being a 16 year old teenage girl. And I had an empty milk jug and I threw it at her and my, and hit her, you know, it's empty. It wasn't a big deal, but my dad's like, we, we don't behave like that in this house. Like we don't, we don't do that. And so he took my door off the hinges and for a 16 year old girl where mm -hmm. privacy is a big deal. That's a, that's a big deal. And I remember, cause I'm a resourceful kid and I was also Roger Combs's daughter. I knew how to hang a door. And so I was up there and I said, you know what? Like he came from his bedroom. I was like, I know he put the pins on his dresser. So I was like, I'm just going to go hang this door myself and I'll just have my door back. So I go, I go into his bedroom and the pins are not on the dresser. And I'm just creeping back across the floor upstairs to get back to my room. And I hear this voice from the bottom of the stairs, looking up for me, holding the pins in his hand saying, I'm looking for these little girl. <laughs> and I'm like, no, I had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and he said, oh. sure you did. So he had my number. I mean, because I think we had a very similar thought process. So that was like a very impactful story. I mean, I'm not trying to criticize the youth of, today in any way. Um, but I've had people say that's abuse. You took away privacy. And I said, no, it wasn't. It was an inconvenience for a 16 year old girl to have to walk her butt down the, the hall to get changed in a bathroom instead of the privacy of her bedroom. I was like, it was a lesson and it was back in less than 24 hours when I apologized, you know? Yeah, so. I, you know, I don't, I don't want to come off sounding like the old man who had a bear <laughs> chasing him in the snow uphill both ways to school or anything, but we could do a lot more these days with some some hardened true love that's consistent as opposed to taking a me day and claiming to be bullied every time you turn around. So I love that story. That's so good. Yeah. And I, I would have never thought of removing the door. Oh, it was a good one. It was a good yeah, one. Yeah, that is really pretty good. <laughs> so as you start to get these pictures uh, on social media with the hashtag pancakes for Roger, uh, I'm guessing they just sporadically appear because somebody's picking up the book at a different time than somebody else. Is that a little injection of joy for you every time you see that? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, I mean, we really focus on the whole campaign, like the month of February. So February is like just, man, I can, it's hard to work the month of February because we're counting pictures and, and, and updating the pancake map and everything like that. It's been crazy, but we do get them throughout the year. So it always seems like I, we get like a smattering of them after I do like an interview. And so we, we highlight them on social media too. And it's, it, man, it's just been fun. It's been a lot of fun because it just reminds people to appreciate what you have. There's something every single one of us can be grateful for every single day. We have a, a tremendous following of veterans to uh, li that listen to the big impact. And we frequently try to feature stories of some of the great American heroes. So I saw that. I yeah, saw my hope is that we will, uh, we will have a little injection of hashtag pancakes for Roger from our audience. And, and not only that, of course, but to have folks go and pick up the book. Um, it, it just, it's a fascinating story. And I can tell that you have a, a great deal, not only of love for dad, but also of pride in what he stood for and how the two of you had a relationship that's, um, um, it still lingers very strongly in, in your heart. That, that, that is, that comes through clearly. Oh, good. That makes me happy. Well, my, my dad served in three branches of the military and he served for 39 years and four months. I mean, he's wow. got a four page Wikipedia page. I mean, he was, he was a badass. I mean, I do a lot of public speaking and I, I put a picture up um, of, I think a lot of us have dads that were in Vietnam that have their Rambo pictures. And I'm like, how many of you guys have the picture of Rambo before Rambo even existed? You know, I mean, it's pretty cool. And um, one of my favorite pictures of him in Vietnam his uncle, um, his uncle Ralph was running for re-election for state Senate in the state of Missouri. And so he had re-election bumper stickers and he put them all over the helicopters in Vietnam that said re-elect Ralph Combs, you know, for state <laughs> Senate. And so there's, um, after he passed, we had always seen like a couple of pictures, but after he passed away and we were going through things, we found like about 12 different candid pictures of him laying down and him flying, you know, things like that with the, with the bumper stickers. So my dad always had a, a very good sense of humor about things too.
Well, one last question for you, Susan, and that is uh, for anybody who, who picks up the book, Pancakes for Roger, what's the primary takeaway you'd like them to, to take away from reading it? Well, when I when I started the book, I was very realistic with my motives. I wanted to help five people and I wanted to bring more recognition to the Veterans Clinic at the University of Missouri because I just truly believe in what they're doing. Um, because understanding what families go through firsthand, I think any help you can get, you don't have to be an alumni from the University of Missouri. You don't have to be from the state of university to get help from them. So, you know, that's one of the things that I, I just want people to know that there's help out there. Um, and then not everybody has great mentors or not everybody has a mentor. So I always say like, hey, if you're looking for a mentor, or you're looking for some good life lessons, like, you know, a kick in the ass, pick up the book and let it be your mentor until you find somebody. I'll leave it there. I can't thank you enough. You're a great storyteller. And I can uh, I can tell that you are accustomed to sharing what uh, what dad stood for. So thanks for sharing that with the big impact audience. And now, folks, your assignment to go out and have some pancakes. Absolutely. Take a picture <laughs> and put up a hashtag pancakes for Roger. And oh, by the way, I don't think Susan would mind if you jumped onto Amazon or wherever books are found and picked up a copy of the book as well. Susan, thank you. Thank you so much.